July 20th, year of our Lord, 2022, day three of SEC Media Days. We are live in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. So happy to have you with us. The interviews are just flowing. One thing we always want to do, and anytime we take this show on the road, it's to get you more access, and I got a barrel full of it for you. Kirby Smart is about to join the show. Sam Pittman, Arkansas head coach, going to join the show. We are also very aware of ACC Media Days going on, and the commissioner, Jim Phillips, over there, made some really interesting comments about conference realignment and all the stuff that's been happening. The major earthquake that college football currently experiencing. I'll have some things to say about that before the end of the show. They're watching us in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. They're watching us in Spartanburg, South Carolina, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Cedar Rapids, Iowa tuned in. My promise to you before we start any interviews, by the end of this show, I will give you an update on when the Late Kick store will reopen. Stay tuned for that. I promised it. I haven't forgotten. But until then, Let's get into the show. Georgia head coach Kirby Smart rolls in first thing this morning. Had a ton of stuff to ask him about. Here is our sit down with Georgia head coach Kirby Smart. Georgia head coach Kirby Smart here, day three of SEC Media Days. You're coming off a national champ. You know you're coming off a national championship, yeah? Oh, I've heard. Okay, so you remember that. I don't that. remember much, but they, they tell me that. We were there. I mean, we were there in Indianapolis that night, and confetti's raining down on you. And then you come back out on the field afterwards, be in the locker room, do some post game stuff. And I'm sure it's been a whirlwind since then. You had to have grown up thinking about what it would be like to win a national championship in Georgia. Assistant coach, turn into a head coach. A lot of folks say, man, you build that stuff up in your mind, but then it's like drinking the success from a fire hose. You don't ever really get to settle down. Does it feel like you thought it would feel? Uh, I'm not sure that anything will ever uh, achieve what you think that is. You know, there's moments out on the field after the game that several coaches were like, man, is this relief or is this excitement? You know, and there's a fine line between relief from, oh, we want it, versus excitement, which we want it. You know, and there's a, there's a, there's a fine line between that. And I think it's tough as a, a head coach because the minute we win it, I'm thinking about what we got to do next year to, to, to be the best football team we can be. And you don't let yourself enjoy it. It's something you look back on when you finish. You had the benefit of having been on championship teams before. Right. And from the outside, we always heard those stories about the next morning and about those meetings and about – we got to get the team to win this thing again next year. So you have plenty of time to think about that and your own preparatory methods. How did you carry that out? Did you, did you feel the sense of lighting a new fire immediately, knowing that you got to guard against complacency? Yeah, I, I felt the sense of urgency. I, I, what I didn't do was have a staff meeting the next morning like we did in Pasadena <laughs> one time. Oh, man, Coach Saban's the best. We, uh, we had a staff meeting the next morning about everything we did wrong against Texas, and uh, you knew you were on the way to winning another one. But we didn't have a staff meeting the next morning, but we certainly uh, were gearing ourselves towards that February signing date, the portal, who's going to be available, how are we going to make our roster better. I mean, there were so many things going on after we won it. You know, We didn't have a kid going to the portal until after the game, but we had eight or nine kids that we knew were going in. So you have to be ready to replace those guys. And uh, that's critical. And I think the timing of that is, is tough. That's what makes college football coaching almost impossible now because the calendar doesn't fit the schedule. So when that game ended, for us, it was relief, joy, excitement. Uh-oh, we better get to work because we're going to lose some guys and we've got to find some more guys. A lot of coaches, obviously, are talking about portal and NIL. You can't talk about one without the other. Sure. Or at least I can. Mm -hmm. And people have different philosophies on it. One of the things that I've heard recently, we had Coach Saban in here yesterday, a number of guys off the record keep saying, man, who's protecting the players? Who's looking out for making folks follow through on the promises that are given, especially when it comes to NIL? A lot of people use wild, wild west in terminology to describe what's happening right now. So what's the philosophy been like at Georgia, and how do you look at what you guys are doing and maybe the rest of the landscape and see differences of methodology out there? Right. I don't know enough about what other people are doing, and I try really hard to focus on what we're doing because I've always thought you can only control what's in your environment, and I want to do the best job of presenting what we have to kids. And let's be honest. Let's, let's be careful because it's easy for me, and I've been that guy on the soapbox killing NIL and saying this is terrible, this is bad for our game. There are parts of it that are bad. There are also parts of it that are really good, and probably more good than bad. We only talk about the bad. I got a young man, Dan Jackson, who walked on at University of Georgia, who's now one of our starting safeties, who is getting his college education paid for as a walk-on because he's getting NIL money. 
You know, I got a young man that has a sick father with dialysis at home, and he's using NIL money to help pay for his dad's dialysis. That otherwise, he'd have to go home and work if he didn't have that opportunity. So there's some really good things that are happening. It's the abuse, right? It's the abuse and the pay for play that concerns everybody for when a guy is trying to make a decision on where to go to school. It's almost impossible to monitor, you know. And I, th I feel like where we have been an advantage from Georgia and what I worry about, we got 95 guys that have NIL deals. I rival that with anybody in the country. Okay, I'm not going to sit and brag about a total number, but I'm going to tell you we got 95 guys. We've got a defensive lineman last year that made more than anybody. He was a feature player. We've got a corner that makes more than any other corner. We've got a, a tight end that makes more than any other tight end. But the total number is not what's important. It's the opportunity these guys have to capitalize on name, image, and likeness the right way. But they all earned it by being pretty good players before they came into that. A lot of people look at the head coaching job at Georgia, and they say, man, if I had the head coaching job at Georgia, I'd never have to leave the state. The place is just loaded with talent. And you guys take a healthy amount of in-state talent, but you also still utilize kind of a, a regional to even a national recruiting strategy. How do you develop the, the philosophy? A lot of people look at it and say, why does he leave the state? A lot of people need to look back no further than January and say, what he's doing is working. Right. So sometimes guys get out of state, but then you're recruiting nationally anyway. So how do you develop that philosophy? Well, the first philosophy is take care of home. If I could do things in the state and not have to leave, I would certainly do that. But the state doesn't necessarily supply the perfect what you need. So when you go to the grocery store, you've got to know what you need, right? I'm going to buy this, this, or this. Well, I might need an offensive tackle, and it might be a down year at offensive tackle in our state. So I've got to go outside. What our state does is puts out really good football players. That's evidenced by the draft last year where we had 30 players that played high school football in the state of Georgia drafted. That's incredible for the population we have. So you say you shouldn't have to leave. But you're not going to win them all. And in today's day and age, these kids, they can see and do things in Texas from Georgia. So they have an opportunity to go. But guess what? We can go to Texas, too, and get an A.D. Mitchell. We can go to California and get a Brock Bowers or a Kendall Milton. So you have to recruit nationwide because you don't know what your state's going to supply. But I don't want to be flying over a kid like Eric Stokes to go all the way to California when he's 30 minutes down the road. How big a believer are you in utilizing doubt outside or disrespect outside or is it all about internally if we take care of business doesn't matter what anyone says because even coming back from a national championship you got a quarterback in Stetson Bennett yeah. and I crack open the preseason magazines I don't see his name and see I don't know think that's this, nowhere I mean I see all these lists and I'm like man you're talking about a total disrespect for a guy that's played pretty good football okay and I agree with you I, I come here and I don't want to get on a soapbox about it but you know what he just keeps disproving everybody and uh, he, he's, he's an incredible leader. Um, and I hate it for him because his road is an interesting story in and of itself. This guy's never been the number three, uh, the number two, the number one until this last year. And look what he's done. He's led a team to a national championship. Yeah, we had a tremendous defense, but that guy made plays. He made plays in the playoff with his feet and his legs. He made incredible throws. And, you know, they're going to continue to doubt him. I think he understands that, but he's a great story and he's a great kid. Do you guys do – exactly what you want offensively. I know the, the point's to win games. The point yeah. is to put points on the board, though, as well. If you could just snap your fingers and do exactly what you guys want to do in terms of philosophy offensively, is this what it looks like, or is it evolving? Do you eventually want to stretch the field more? How do you ultimately want to go about offensive football? You said it. I want to score points, and I want to be explosive. And to do that, you got to have explosive football players. you got to have healthy explosive football players. So we feel like, or at least I feel like with Coach Munkin, we've added an NFL dynamic, free release back, five out, um, ability to do multiple things. Um, that helps guys sell our offense to – high school prospects. They want to play an NFL system. Well, Coach Monk's done that. He's done that. He's done it at Tampa. He's done it at Cleveland. He's had success in the NFL. So when you start looking at that, you want to sell the total system. Now, what that specifically is depends on our players. We've got elite tight ends right now. We've got a couple exceptionally fast wide receivers. We've got to utilize their skill sets so that guys can see that. Last question for you. What's keeping you up at night right now? When you look at your team and you're about to break fall camp in a few weeks, what are the biggest areas, not concern, but the biggest question marks that you know you got to get after and address? Well, start on defense. We just lost so many experienced players. I think we've got talented players. How do we get them to buy in and play well together and not think they got to be N'Kobe Dean and Jordan Davis? They don't have to be those guys. they got to be the best version of themselves. That, that, that worries me. You know, offensively, we got a lot of players coming back. 
We have a lot of experience at tight end, quarterback, even running back and receiver. We got guys coming back with touches. That's where the complacency worries you. They've got to buy in to be an elite, not just just as good as we were last year. We got to be better, and I think they get that. Georgia head coach Kirby Smart, I appreciate it. Thank you, appreciate it. Really appreciate Kirby Smart joining us. Uh, that was a big one for us to get early this morning. Did you notice when I asked about the way they want to play offensively, it's a really big topic of conversation around this state. We're in Atlanta right now, and around the Georgia fan base, I mean, they just won a national championship, so it gets no better than that. That's the mountaintop. But if you just look down the road overall, a lot of the teams they recruit against, they have more proven offensive products, shall we say, to offer recruits. Kirby just mentioned that. He said, we need explosive football players in order to ultimately do what we want to do offensively. Now, healthy explosive football players, that's another prerequisite he put on it. And the fact of the matter is, I think for a couple of years now, from the time they brought Todd Munkin in there, I really think they wanted to do different things offensively. I think they thought with JT Daniels at quarterback, they were going to be able to be that last year. And as it turned out, it wasn't that way. That didn't mean they couldn't win. But it still could also be two things are true at the same time. It could be that's the way they had to do it last year. And ultimately, I think they, they want to maybe shift it a little bit more. They don't have to become Alabama of the Eastern Division. Uh, what they did last year ended up beating Alabama, and what they did was plenty good enough. I do think that they want to add a little bit more balance and explosivity into that passing game. I think they'll do that. That's why I think down the road, the 2025-2026 Georgia Bulldog teams will make you look back on 2021 and say, wow, they won a title that year, but look how different the offense looks now. So appreciate Kirby Smart there. Uh, Sam Pittman coming up in just a second. Before that, I was actually doing radio with our buddy Ryan Fowler out of Tuscaloosa a little while ago upstairs. They are also brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. And he did me the honor of handing me the ad copy, and he let me take them to break by reading the Academy ad read because it's second nature. It's second nature to us because it's our exclusive partner. Academy Sports and Outdoors, they are your one-stop shop for all your outdoor sporting goods needs. But they also, they let us do the show. They're the reason that we can do the show and you don't have to pay for the show and we can take the show on the road. So if you're outdoors, you already need the gear, go to Academy Sports and Outdoors to get it. It could be a grill, it could be a bat and ball, it could be a tent, whatever you need. But also know you're supporting the folks that make this show possible when you do that. So we appreciate it. They appreciate it. And since we both appreciate you guys, it's just kind of circle of life. That's really what Elton was singing about in Lion King the whole time. It's just circle of life. So we appreciate you guys. Okay. About two hours after that earlier today, Arkansas and Sam Pittman came in. And I had probably a list of 70 questions that I'd love to just sit down all day, 8 to 5, and ask Sam Pittman. But we did get him for a few minutes. And now I am happy to introduce our interview, our early one-on-one with Sam Pittman, head coach at Arkansas. Arkansas head coach Sam Pittman, from one Fleetwood Mac fan to another. It's really good to have you in here. <laughs> hey, you've been to a lot of concerts yeah, since last yeah. season wrapped up, man. You were just running down the list. It's, yeah, it sounds been, like it's been eventful. It really has. It's been a lot of fun. You know, we, we have access to Little Rock over there, so they bring in concert. Elton John was over there. We saw him. Uh, Eric Church was over there. Uh, but then, you know, we have the amp just north of us, about 20 minutes. And so we've seen a lot of people. It's been, it's been great. I love music. You know, my, my father made all us kids, mother and father made all us kids learn instruments, you know. And so uh, we're b- born and raised around the music, so really, really enjoy concerts. It's really interesting you talk about the free time you have because coaches don't have a whole lot yeah. of it. And one of the biggest talking points in the sport right now is how the college football calendar is out of whack and how yeah. the assistant coaches, they're recruiting four classes simultaneously. You've got to worry about the portal. You've got to learn NIL. How important is it and how hard is it to find some of that free time? Well, I make our coaches. You know, I, I tell them this is when you're out of the office and you have to be out of the office. Um, they need that. Um, I do, too. Uh, I'm getting a little bit better with taking my time as well. Uh, I don't like to be gone at length. You know, I don't like to be gone more than, you know, three or four days if I can help it. Uh, but I make those. They, got, they, they get three full weeks off in the summer and, and uh, plus a little bit, and they need that. Uh, it's a lot of stress in our job. Our players need it. You know, we've given we give our players off obviously from the end of May basically until June, and then they'll get about a week before the season starts. But you got to deload at some point. A high stress uh, uh, job, uh, both as playing and coaching. You need a little bit of time. You need a little downtime. Your program's in a really interesting point right now. I think internally you may feel the same way that people do on the outside. People now look at Arkansas way different than they did a couple of years ago. 
But at the same time, you haven't gotten over to the hump to the point where they look at you and say, Arkansas preseason contender for everything. Mm -hmm. So it's it's this kind of it's a it's a mid world yeah. of sort of having been down, but also not at the mountaintop. They ask you earlier, "Have you arrived?" You said no. Mm -hmm. What do you still have to improve on? Depth. Um, we have to improve in recruiting. Um, I've got as good a coaching staff anybody else here has. I can promise you. Uh, I don't know how I've been so fortunate to do that, but that's been a blessing. Um, I think our starting players can compete with a lot of teams, but we've got to improve that depth. Depth. Uh, we are not a program now that thinks that I hope we win. You know, you got to take the I hope to the I know. You know, you have to. And how you do that is the way you work, the confidence you build in what you do, the game plan that you're running over. We've got to take, hey, man, I hope we win Saturday to the I know we're going to win Saturday. We're not quite there yet, but we're close. And I'm not talking about not quite there with the with some of the guys on the team. We're there with a bunch of guys on the team. But you need all of them for that power to come through at that point, and we're close. In recruiting and coaching transfer portal, you have to take the program from where it was yeah. which is kind of being a backup option if the main thing doesn't work out, to now Arkansas is a place where people are choosing. Your yeah. coaches had options. They choose to be yeah, there. These sure players, did. they have options. They choose to be there. Drew Sanders is one of the most recent examples yeah. out of the transfer portal. You just said, I got the best coaching staff here. How have you been able to cultivate that environment? Man, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I wish I did. Here's what I do know. Barry Odom. That's a job out for every year. Kendall Browse stayed for a significant amount of money less. Cody Kennedy stayed, which I know the team that was wanting him would have paid him a lot more money. Um, we just, I don't know. The guys like, I'm, I'm sure they like the players that they're coaching. Um, I'm sure they like the community. They like the state. Uh, but we've been able to keep them. And it's, I want to keep the guys who have that talk to the most people in the building. That's your strength coach, your special teams coordinator, your offensive coordinator, your defensive coordinator. And then you start running down the line. The next one is your offensive line coach because he's he's handling about 20. I want to keep those guys. If I want to keep them, I want to keep them. The university has stepped up and said, okay, we're going to keep them. If that's what you want to do. I think that's what helps our football program. We can go out to spring ball. We can go out. I guarantee you we'll go out to fall camp. We'll be hitting on all cylinders early. Uh, there's no new terminology. There's no new people. I mean, there's a new secondary coach, new defensive line coach in, in Deke and Dominique. But ter verbiage, terminology, expectations, we've already went through a spring. Not, turnover can be healthy. It can hurt you. And... I don't want to test the other one. Let me get you out of here on this. When you look at this year's team, you've gone through spring, summer conditioning is happening right now. You're about to open fall camp. What are one or two areas that you think about the most as yeah. needing to find something out about in fall camp? Third and one on offense. We've got to figure out to convert a way to convert that. Wide receiver group, what are we going to do? Uh, are we going to, is, who's going to step up there for us? We have the capability. Who's, who's going to be it? What are we going to do with Malik Hornsby? You know, he, he needs to be on the field. He doesn't win the quarterback job. He's got to play. He's got to play wide receiver. Um, who's going to be that pass rusher? Who's going to be that defensive end that comes out? Is it Landon Jackson? Is it, is it, is it Williams? Is it, is it who, who, who is it? Dominic Jordan? Dorian Gerald coming back? Who, who, who's the guy? Eric Gregory? Who's that guy? And then can we play man-to-man -man coverage in cor at, at the corner spot? And I believe all those answers will be said. Yes, we can find. Yes, we can find. And yes, we can cover it at the corner. But those we have to find out. Sam Pittman, a privilege. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for being good to me, man. I Thanks. appreciate it. Sam Pittman's awesome. 
I really wish you guys could be in the room when he walks in. We had to stall because we had to delay the start of the interview because he insists on shaking everybody's hand. He's walking down the hallway here where there's just water available for, for everyone. He said, like, y'all need some water? I got some water over here and started filling up water jugs for everybody. Um, it's very easy to see once you're exposed to him what they see at Arkansas. But you see, Arkansas, because they're in the same division as Alabama and A&M's a high-profile program, LSU's high-profile, sometimes... It regionally or maybe even locally, they're well ahead of the national curve. This happened last year. If you were around that Arkansas team going into the Texas game, the result wasn't a big surprise to you, was it? It was a drubbing, though. The nation took notice, but they really took notice, as I've talked about many times on the show, when they went to Arlington a week or two later and they beat Texas A&M. But I remember being around the team, and I remember how they were very jubilant, and, and it was kind of an outpouring of emotion because they got over a hump they wanted to get over. They weren't surprised, though. Nobody was surprised. The fan base wasn't surprised. They were happy, but they weren't surprised. The nation was because you didn't know that Arkansas had that in them. The nation's also been surprised, as he mentioned there in the interview, to see guys like Kendall Bryles with options that would pay him more staying at Arkansas. Ditto. Barry Odom will be a head coach again one day. Have no doubt about that. We're, we're huge Barry Odom fans on this show. But he chose to stay at Arkansas. A lot of players like Drew Sanders, who transferred from Alabama, could have gone most anywhere in the country, including staying at Alabama and playing a significant role. He chose to go to Arkansas. Hazelwood from Oklahoma could have gone most anywhere, chose to go to Arkansas. I keep saying the word chose because choice is something that a lot of players with, or a lot of players having choice, they haven't opted for Arkansas. They do now. Coaches do now. And it's because of Sam Pittman. And he kind of played it a little bit closer to the vest when I asked him, why is that? Well, he's the reason why. His culture, which starts from him and flows down, that's the reason why. And if you talk to players and coaches behind the scenes there, that's what they say. They say, Pittman's built something. Pitt's built something here. Why would I want to leave it? You know, short of being a major head coach, why would I want to leave here? Now, he's not going to tell anyone to turn down an offer that advances their career or advances their, you know, their standing in the sport. But, man, if, if, if it's even close to comparable, guys are choosing Arkansas now. That was not the case. We, we talked to a number of players today. Some of those guys were on that two-win team. Some of those guys have been there for a while, and they've seen the transition. And <laughs> you, you ask them off the record where you get some better answers even, and they tell you, man, how much time do you have? to talk about how much has changed in this program. How much time do you have? And the answer is usually not much in this setting. But I really appreciate Sam Pittman joining us. Uh, th that Cincinnati-Arkansas game in the running to be the stop in week one, by the way, for the Every Given Saturday Tour. You know what? I'm going to tell you right now, before I get into the final topic, we got a healthy amount of people watching live. I promised you guys when we had to shut down that late kick store Friday, I promised you we were open it again this week. This time tomorrow, actually a little bit earlier, because we're going to start the show earlier tomorrow. I am reopening that store during the live show. I am keeping this amongst us because you deserve an award for being part of the live audience. So we're not going to plaster it all over the place. But if you're in here, I will announce it during the show. We'll probably put the link right here in the, in the live chat. That's when we're going to reopen that thing. I'm telling you right now, supply is going to be limited. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I, I, I would strongly lean towards us selling out again. It won't always be a problem, but it is right now. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. That's when we're reopening that thing. Now you know. Okay, uh, the last thing I wanted to hit today, and I appreciate you guys being tuned in. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Realignment has been a topic every coach has been asked about here. Realignment is a topic they're talking about at every media days. And Jim Phillips, the ACC commissioner, talked about that today at ACC media days. And I'm telling you, I think Jim Phillips may have been watching Late Kick because he started using a lot of terminology, especially the old mansion-gated community type terminology that I've been using on this show to describe the way the sport's headed. And what I've made it analogous to is... So this, the concept of a super conference and the concept of building yourself up to the point where you're, you're, the, you're the bright, shining mansion in town, but the town's burning down around you. And so it doesn't really matter how big your mansion is because your property value is nil because there is no town left. Is that really what you want college football to be? Well, Jim Phillips kind of stepped to the podium today at the ACC Media Day event and said, do we really just want college football to be a bunch of gated communities that are closed off from each other and there's just a couple of them and then everyone else has to move out of town? Like, is that really what we want college football to look like? The answer from almost everyone is no. Almost everyone. 
I think we understand who the yeses are, but I think almost everyone says no. Even those of us like me who grew up in the SEC's footprint, we're, we're at SEC Media Days right now. I've, I've voiced my displeasure about that direction. Now, what I have stopped short of that a lot of you have just gone full bore into is vilifying one person, vilifying Greg Sankey or vilifying Kevin Warren in the Big Ten. I just don't think it's that clean cut. I don't think it's that clear cut. I've, I've told you guys my thinking on that. I'm not going to rehash that today. We don't really have time to do that. But nevertheless, no matter whose fault it is, it's happening. And it's just, it's kind of a helpless feeling. And I know because we can see the numbers now. If you're Jim Phillips over there in the ACC, I mean, some of these projections, guys, are out of this world. You will make, as a member um, institution in the SEC, very soon, you will be cashing an annual paycheck that is about three times more than a member institution in the ACC will cash. In other words, Arkansas will make three times more. Or, let me put it another way that will really hit you right smack in the mouth. Mississippi State, Vanderbilt, will make three times more than the Clemson Tigers will, simply because of the sticker on the back of their helmet. That's not sustainable. If you want to maintain yourself as a, a quote-unquote power what we currently call a Power Five level conference, that's not the future. Pa power Five is a phrase. That's a term that is going by the wayside. I don't know if it's going to be Power Two in the future. I know it's certainly not going to be Power Five. And Jim Phillips is kind of standing up on the podium saying the only thing he can say. What else could he say? Well, what other line of, of thinking could he have than, I don't like what's happening. We as a conference are locked in this grant of rights deal. We've got to cash the check. We're cashing until the mid-2030s. So that's not going anywhere. And you always want to say, but, and then you want to have some hope that maybe something could be on the horizon. Short of reworking that deal, which the, it's certainly the powers that be at ESPN have no reason to do, no incentive to do, I don't really know how that works. And that's why I'm not very confident in, in the future standing of that conference. I don't think some of the member institutions that would be attractive, i.e. Miami, i.e. FSU, i.e. Clemson, I don't think they're super crazy about the future prospects there. So I don't know when it's going to happen, and I certainly don't know how it's going to happen because there's, there's a lot of financial uh, limitation on that. But I think there, there are going to be some ties that are cut over there because the future is untenable. How in the world do you call yourself competing with the other behemoths in the sport as, as an individual school? making three times less per year than they do. I don't know how that's going to happen. Uh, but I was listening to him earlier today. I empathized with him. I even agree with a lot of what he's saying. Nick Saban on the show yesterday kind of said the same thing. I just don't know what option you have. And I also, as much as some of us, Jim Phillips included, ask whether we want this to look like NFL light, and we answer no, 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 think some of the people pulling the strings answer yes 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 because the folks at the executive level especially at the network level do not view that as a bad thing they view this becoming nfl light as a very good thing because they would look back at you and me when we talk about tradition and we talk about regionality and we talk about the unique fabric of college football and they would say why wouldn't you want to be like the nfl the nfl is our most profitable property by 10 miles and we look back at them and say we don't care about the money and they look back at us and that's when they kind of drop the hammer because they do. And they do, period. There is no but. There's just, well, we do care about it. And we got both hands on the wheel and you're in the back seat. And if that's the way it's got to be, that's the way it's got to be. It's not like you just throw your fandom in the wood chipper. It's still going to be a very, very fun sport to watch. It's just going to be a different sport to watch. We appreciate you guys. We, we try and maintain this show as the same show that you've, that you've come to love and, and support. And uh, it gives us the ability to do these sorts of things. So until tomorrow, it's going to have an earlier start time. Make sure you're following on the socials at Lake Kick Josh. I'll be sure to keep you up to date and informed. Until tomorrow, for our entire crew here in Atlanta, I'm Josh Pate signing off. Have a great rest of your evening, and God bless.